Hello, Internet, and welcome to another edition of Critical Q&A, the show where I answer your questions that you've sent me on the comments section uh, below on this video, or uh, email to me, or get to me uh, some other fashion. Got a lot of questions coming in. I'm going to try to give some uh, rapid-fire answers here today and get through uh, a, some backlog of them. I'm sorry I've been away for a couple weeks. I had some... Uh, I had some surgery on my on my eye, and, uh, and it was a little bit uh, something I, I didn't see coming, and <laughs> and uh, didn't uh, didn't predict for anyway. So I haven't been able to uh, to get any to get a new Q and A video out for a couple weeks. So here we go, Kirsta. You talked about what parts of the Church of Scientology would need to go, and you talked about Zenu in this episode. I just wondered if you think the Scientology Genesis myth would also need to go. Because among all the atrocities the, quote, church, quote, commits, I find that story mostly harmless, ironically, and even kind of cute. As far as Genesis myths go, it's not even in bad company. All of those are kind of out there. Yeah, I've said from the very beginning of me speaking out against the church Scientology or against cults in general that it's not the belief system that I have a problem with, and I still maintain that. I... I have, you know, talked about Xenu, I've talked about, um, you know, what it takes, auditing and the, the efficacy of auditing and, and training and whatnot in Scientology, and I don't happen to believe that it does what it says it's supposed to do. But as far as the actual beliefs go, as far as wanting to believe in body thetans or Xenu or, or spiritual beings, thetans in general, all that, that mythology of of Scientology and the, and the space opera of it, earlier galactic civilizations and the idea of man being around for, you know, billions and billions of years and all that. I, I don't have a problem with any of that. I don't think those things are what are harmful about Scientology. Uh, if everybody in Scientology just believed that and that was all there was to it, I, I don't think anybody would care. Uh, it's the disconnection, it's the harassing, it's the stalking, it's the 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 human rights abuses, the human trafficking, all the other stuff that they do, that's the stuff that we have a problem with with Scientology. So, um, so it's not the beliefs. And it's also how I happen to feel about any other religion. Uh, I don't have a thing about their beliefs. You want to believe that, you know, uh, Muhammad is the prophet or that Jesus Christ is your personal savior. It's, I, I don't care. I don't, I don't have a thing on it. So uh, there you go. Glenn Anderson. One thought has occurred to me as I watch yours and others' videos. Scientologists are referred to often without distinguishing whether they're public Scientologists or Sea Org members. Clearing this up is most helpful to those of us who are never in Scientology and have learned the culture from the internet. For example, as you answer the question about being trolled, it would be interesting to know whether they're Sea Org directed by their superiors, if they're public members that feel the need to engage you even though they're not supposed to read, and theta on the internet, or if they are hired guns like the private investigators and lawyers they use to go after apostates. It's possible you don't know, but it would be interesting to have your opinion. Okay, Glenn, so yeah, I actually don't know. I can't tell from the nature of how somebody is talking to me on the internet whether they're uh, a, a Sea Org member directed there by uh, OSA, by the Office of Special Affairs, or if they are a private investigator, or if they're just Joe... Scientologist who came across my channel on the internet and decided to uh, do something they're not supposed to do, which is which is read the N theta, read my work, or listen or watch my videos, uh, or engage with me. Now, it, I have I will say that I have engaged with people who have challenged me, as though when people come onto my YouTube channel or write to me on my blog, and uh, and say they're a Scientologist or infer that, you know, from their viewpoint that they're a Scientologist, I'll, I've tried to engage them. And it's been fairly clear to me that they were only there to disturb and, and create a ruckus or, or try to get some jabs in or something like that. And they weren't really there to actually really have any kind of intellectual debate or conversation. They were just there to try to uh, call me a hate monger or, you know, say I was lying. Like, for example, if somebody comes on my channel and says, this is just a bunch of lies, 
then I will answer them and say, please tell me, you know, thank you very much, please tell me exactly what it is that I lied about. I want to know. What did I get wrong? Tell me. And so far, nada. Not, not, nothing has substantial has come from that. Uh, and I found it to be kind of a waste of my time. So I'm not so interested in engaging now. But as far as, again, the nature of your question here, Glenn, uh, as far as the nature of, of who's engaging me, it's really impossible to say. But I, uh, it, it shouldn't be regular Scientologists because there would, they would get in a lot of trouble if, they, uh, if it was known by the church that they were engaging me because they're not even supposed to be talking to me. I put my, I put my work out there because I want them to watch it and if they want to email me privately or something like that, I'm, I'm all for that. I'll, I'll have that conversation. Billy Joe Copsell. Hello there. Is there a difference between the treatment of Sea Org, staff, and just general members? If you keep in mind that Scientology is a business, then the Scientology parishioners or the, the general public are their customers. And those are the people they want to keep happy. So. Uh, you know, through the course of training or auditing that uh, general public will receive, or most especially if they start getting into any kind of uh, what's called ethics trouble, where they're going to have to go see an ethics officer to deal with some problem or situation uh, in their life or in relation to them in relation to Scientology, they, during the course of that, they might, uh, you know, be talked to severely or sternly or given a, you know, a severe reality adjustment, in other words, get yelled at. Um, but you're not going to generally see physical abuse or sleep deprivation or, you know, real, uh, you know, kind of human, uh, human rights abuses rain down on the general public of Scientology, which is why most of them don't think that the things that critics like me talk about uh, are real because they haven't experienced those things for themselves. The, they, if they leave and they start speaking out, they experience disconnection. Um, if they get declared, you know, and that's, that, you know, wakes them up. Uh, but, uh, but otherwise, they, they don't experience the same kind of things that staff members or Sea Org members experience. Staff members work in organizations, they're supposed to work full time, which means 40 hours a week, so, or more, and it's often way more. So, they will get, um, you know, they'll experience things like sleep deprivation. They'll get, there'll be a lot of high intensity pressure put on them to make their quotas, make their targets, uh, especially income targets. They'll be, they'll be set where the organization is expected to make $10,000, $20,000, $50,000, you know, before the end of the week, before Thursday at 2 p.m., which is the week from Thursday to Thursday in Scientology organizations. That's how they operate. So, uh, so they're racing to get you know their quotas met by Thursday at two, and there's a lot of psychological pressure exerted on them to get that get those quotas met um, in the form of of uh, you know kind of harassing communications and and disciplinary actions taken on them. You know they could scrub toilets or they could end up having to clean or you know renovate stuff like that. But it's not generally real hard. You know staff members in in local organizations are not going to experience hard physical labor or uh, much in the way of, of, of real physical abuse. When you move up to the level of the sea organization is where, is where they control every aspect of your life. They feed you, they clothe you, they birth you. And so they have complete control over everything you're doing. And at that point is when the kid gloves really come off and it's, you know, you better be producing and you better be getting uh, you know, things done, and, uh, and it's yes sir, yes sir, uh, which way sir, you know, how high sir should I be jumping sir, sort of attitude in the sea organization, and, and it's 24-7. And it's you can get woken up 2, 3 in the morning, uh, you know, people knocking on your door, telling you that you need to get up and go handle some situation or some created emergency that's going on, or Conversely, you never get to bed because you're up until 2, 3, 4, or 5 in the morning or you don't go to bed at all trying to hit those targets or hit those quotas or make that money or get whatever it is done that you're supposed to be getting done. Um, and the Sea Org doesn't think twice about that sort of thing, about, about that kind of work. That's expected. That's what you're supposed to be doing. Um, 
And at this, and then in terms of disciplinary actions, you know, hard physical labor, um, psychological torment and abuse. I mean, you get yelled and screamed at. You can get thrown around. Um, there can be physical abuse, uh, not just from David Miscavige, which has been talked about, but I mean, for example, I had a senior executive, you know, slap me uh, one time, you know, just backhand me. Um, not because I did anything that really deserved it. It was just this person was was a bit nuts and uh, and decided that that was a way to handle me. Uh, and that sort of thing, it can be. I've I've been around in the C organization when that sort of activity is encouraged. When it's when yes, how you're supposed to deal with people. So uh, so it's not you know an isolated incident. It's actually written into the policies of the C organization, which by the way the general public doesn't see. The policies for the C organization are not the same policies as what's issued to the public and what the public see. It's all confidential. Uh, in the C organization, those are called flag orders. And the reason I bring that up is, again, it's another reason why the general public don't believe some of what goes on in the C organization because they don't see it, they don't hear about it, the C organization members don't tell them about it. Uh, and so they never see or hear this. So to them, you know, us critics are just a bunch of liars because they're, we're saying things that they've never seen or experienced. But we're not liars. Uh, that is how it is. That is how things go on in the in the inner circle of the C organization. So, uh, so that's the various uh, the treatment at the different levels of Scientology. Mr. Bazzini, I think this is a major thought of most of us who follow you and others. We now know that they have $1 billion. We can estimate that they have about 30,000 active members in the USA. Surely these 30,000, excluding the whales, are going bust. So how long before Scientology hits terminal decline? As a business model, they cannot survive. Their costs will only ever increase whilst more and more blow. The exit rate can only become more rapid. The financial decline can only accelerate at an alarming pace as Miscavige has to keep up his fake front at huge cost. Many thanks and best wishes. Okay, well, the actual assets of the Church of Scientology are greater than $3 billion, actually, if you really get down into the books of it and look at the assets, the, the land, the, the buildings, everything. It's, it's well in excess of that. So, so they've actually got, I don't know, liquid assets in terms of actual money. I, I don't know how much they actually have on hand, but rest assured, it's a lot certainly enough to keep going for quite a while. Um, and they don't really concentrate right now on getting new members in, or uh, I don't think it's really possible to get too many new members in, given the you know, wealth of, of information available on the internet about Scientology. I mean, if you Google Scientology, you will never, ever want to go anywhere near that place, uh, at least if you have you know, a couple brain cells to rub together at this point. So, uh, so their new membership must be just, just totally, totally tanked. Um, but they, the, the whales, the, the, the people in Scientology who have a lot of money, we, whales is actually a term from, from Vegas. It's a, it's a, it's a casino term. It's, you know, the, the, the big whale, the big fish, you know, uh, walks into the casino. That's, that's the guy with all the money. And that's, uh, that's now we talk about whales in Scientology being the, the big donors, the guys who really are supporting Scientology and giving a lot of money to it. And, they're actually, I think, the major source of, of income to the church at this point, and they are a major source. We've got uh, Tony Ortega's blog recently posted uh, a bunch of pictures and, um, and showed the amount of money that these people are giving, and, and it's millions and millions and millions of dollars. Uh, there's a guy, Bob Duggan, uh, who is a billionaire, he's a legitimate billionaire, and he has given more than anybody else ever. Uh, lots and lots of money. He got some big, huge trophy given to him for, for his, uh, his donations. Um, literally, the trophy was as big as a table. I mean, it was just ridiculous. And that's what they do. They, they give these trophies to these people. And, and it's all about status. And it's all about uh, you know, going up those levels uh, as a member because that's what Scientology is. is it's, it's, uh, you know, at that level, it's it's, it's feeding ego and it's, it's feeding narcissism and that's, that's what Scientology is really all about. So, uh, so the contributions of those whales is really not to be discounted because they're still making millions and millions of dollars on those guys, uh, plus the general membership, which is not huge. It is a shrinking membership, but it is still an active one. And um, 
personally, I think that even if, e even if, uh, you know, you lose a few whales or you lose a, a, a good chunk of the general population, the general membership, uh, Scientology still has legs to carry it for, for quite some time. So it really is just a matter of how long Miscavige is going to be around, David Miscavige, the, the leader of the church, and how much longer, you know, the inertia can carry it forward. But quite honestly, by all the indications I see, it's not tanking. Uh, it's not going anywhere uh, anytime soon. It's, it's still got quite a bit of, of, uh, of forward inertia going. And, and quite a bit of money, quite a bit, quite a few assets. So, uh, so don't look for Scientology to be gone tomorrow or the next day, unless there's a Berlin Wall type incident where something massive changes organizationally. Like, as I've said before, if David Miscavige were to disappear tomorrow, uh, through however he does that, whether he if he were to pass on or if he were to take off and take off a bunch of money, or whatever, however he would disappear, if that occurs. I think we'll see an implosion of the organization, uh, but until that happens, I don't, I don't really see that that's a, that that's a, a real threat right now. Public interest. At 12 minutes 34 seconds on the Z News story, you state that it was spiritual selves or thetans in Scientology's, not aliens, that were transported to Earth. In Scientology, it stated that the thetan has. No mass, no wavelength, and no location. Um, how do you get something with no mass or location into an ice cube to put into a plane to drop into a volcano? Also, were there refreshments on the flight, maybe something salty to go along with the alcohol and glycol? All right, well, uh, here's, you know, you have a very good point, and, um, but here's actually how Hubbard explains it within the scriptures of Scientology is, uh, a thetan, a spiritual being in Scientology, is defined as a somethingness, which is a nothingness. It is a, it is a, it does not exist in physical universe terms. It has no mass, no wavelength, no space. Uh, it doesn't take up any space. It doesn't have any weight. It simply exists, and uh, it exists sort of outside of the 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 reality of the of the physical universe of matter, energy, space, and time. So, uh, so if you, you know, have the idea, for example, that, uh, that God created the universe, well, then that means that God must exist outside of the universe, right? It's not really that, that much of a stretch of, of thought to get that idea. So, uh, Thetans, spiritual beings in Scientology, are the same thing. They existed before the existence of matter, energy, space, and time. Now, what Hubbard says is that because they have degraded in their abilities over the eons that they've existed in the, the messed universe, matter, energy, space, and time, matter, energy, space, and time, messed, okay, that's the word that Scientology uses for physicality, for physical stuff, is messed. So they refer to the universe, the physical universe, as the messed universe. And in the messed universe, uh, this place is billions and billions and billions of years old, according to L. Ron Hubbard, trillions of years old. So, uh, so, so Thetans have been here for a really, really, really long time, near, near infinite amount of time. And over all of those eons, they have had you know, billions and billions of, uh, of bodies uh, lifetime after lifetime after lifetime, and all those experiences, and uh, and Hubbard counts on you know he, he details lots and lots of experiences that have happened uh, through these eons. Thetans have degraded their 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 abilities, their uh, viewpoint, their idea of themselves has has degraded down to where they act like messed. They act like matter, energy, space, and time. They no longer think of themselves as spiritual beings. They think of themselves as a body, right? Or as, you know, a, a rock or whatever it is that they are, that they happen to be being. So, uh, I, again, this is all within the Scientology, you know, uh, belief system. So, so if you can get a spiritual being, the whole, the whole idea of Scientology is that all of this has become a trap. 
and that, that Thetans have been trapped in the messed universe, that they're stuck here, and they, they can't, they don't know how to get out anymore because they've, you know, through all these years have agreed to and agreed to and agreed to being here and have agreed that this is all that there is, and so they kind of forgot and no longer have the abilities that they once had, and they can't just step out. And the proof of that is, if you right now were to consider yourself as, a, as an infinite immortal spiritual being, does that give you any ability to just step out of your body and go fly off and do something else? Well, no, it doesn't. And Hubbard says the reason for that is because of all this crap that's happened to you, and that's why you have to go up all those levels of Scientology to strip away all that crap and regain your own spiritual self, your own spiritual abilities, and that's what Scientology is promising when they're promising uh, that the whole operating Thetan thing is, is, is right now you're not operating as a Thetan, you're operating as a body, as, as, as a rock, you know, and, uh, and the whole goal of Scientology is to get you up to this, this ultimate spiritual state. And uh, that sounds great, but of course the only problem is that they don't deliver that, not anything remotely like that. Uh, nobody, uh, you know, who's attained those highest levels in Scientology uh, has, any, has demonstrated any evidence uh, that they operate uh, better or wiser or uh, anything better than, uh, than your average Joe. So, there you go. Denny Young. I have not yet watched Going Clear, but have watched the BBC documentary, some of your videos, David Mango's videos, etc. What I still simply do not understand is what the wins are and what the positives and successes are that hook people. Clearly there must be some, as the tech does seemingly win over intelligent and accomplished people. I really need to understand, as I suspect, that we are all at risk. It seems that it must be some incredible and impressive gains to cajole people into accepting the extortion and manipulation. Thank you so much for your candor. Okay, so yeah, there are real tangible gains to be had using some of the results of Scientology. And by real and tangible, I mean to the person. Uh, you know, not necessarily permanent gains, but they are tangible. They, the person feels them. They, they are very real to a person. Uh, for example, a person could come into Scientology, be very stressed about, uh, you know, their marriage, uh, maybe be on the brink of divorce. Well, maybe the guy gets his wife or she gets her husband to come in and they talk to a person in, you know, who's a Scientologist in the church and maybe they take a communications class together or they address some of the issues that are, are bugging them about their marriage and they are not, you know, clearly they're having issues uh, maybe because they can't communicate very well. They, everything always degrades into a fight. So they go into a church of Scientology and they sit down with somebody who helps, you know, sort of keep the, the fight to a minimum and they resolve some of their issues. They have had a tangible gain and maybe they could even say that Scientology saved their marriage and maybe it really did. And then they do a communications class and uh, they learn about, you know, how to communicate better and through common sense principles, as I've said before with the communications class, of being able to, you know, listen, being able to try to understand the other person's point of view, that sort of thing. They have, a, you know, more tangible gains with that and they really improve their marriage. Now they're going to walk out of there saying and telling other people Scientology helped them and Scientology works and Scientology saved their marriage. And, um, and that happens to people. That happened to my parents when I was uh, a very, very young child. And they got remarried. They were divorced, and they got back together. And uh, and so you know, the whole time that I was growing up with in around Scientology, I didn't know anything about Xenu and, and galactic civilizations and all that. But I did know that my parents were together because of Scientology, and uh, and I had to credit it with that. So I was amenable to then. I was open to the idea of going in and finding out more about it when I got older, you know, when I was 15. And, uh, and then when I went in and found out about it, as I've related, uh, I had wins with uh, real tangible solid wins with communication. You know, I went back to school 
after taking a communications class in Scientology, and I was able to talk to girls. I was not so shy. I was not so introverted, and and I and I you know definitely credited Scientology with that. I also took a study class. I took a class in Scientology about how to study. And, uh, and I was able to more easily learn things as a result of that. Now, I found out after getting out of Scientology that that, that study methodology that, that, that Hubbard talks about isn't something he actually came up with. It's something that's, that a couple Scientologists came up with in the 60s and they gave to Hubbard and then Hubbard took it and said he's the one who came up with it, uh, which I, I found fascinating after I got out of Scientology. I had no idea Hubbard was a, was a plagiarist. But he, he was. So anyway, point being that you know people can, the, the, the point there is that there are things that people can get out of Scientology that aren't really Hubbard's inventions or Hubbard's works. Uh, you know, he took it from somebody else. I mean, Dianetics uh, procedure, for example, has a lot of similarities to Freudian uh, psychoanalysis and regression therapy and things like that. I mean, there's there's all kinds of things he was cherry picking and choosing and taking out of their other subjects. So the workability of Scientology, the things that work in Scientology, are not necessarily out of Hubbard's head. You know, is, is my point. But they people not knowing that go into church Scientology, do Scientology think it's Scientology and then assign all of their, their wins and, and successes to Scientology. And of course, I can't really answer this question without addressing the, the euphoria that occurs as a result of Scientology auditing, the, the counseling, the, the processing. Um, you know, going back and, and looking at past experiences in a new light, re-examining, re-evaluating earlier conclusions, I mean, this is all psychology, psychiatry 101. I mean, it's nothing, you know, earth-shattering. But, uh, but there's a very exact procedure to, you know, how Hubbard said to do this auditing procedure. And it, you know, and it produces, uh, it, it can produce, I should say, in some people, not everybody, uh, a kind of euphoria, a really, really great feeling uh, to realize maybe, for example, that uh, there was an earlier incident in your past when you were a child, maybe, that you forgot all about. And you recall that, and you look at that, and you relate it to now, and you see a pattern that you've had maybe of, I don't know, you know, uh, whatever. Uh, maybe a pattern of self-invalidation or a pattern of, of abuse or whatever. And you realize, oh, wow, you know, it doesn't have to be that way. Maybe I could change my mind about that. And... You, you credit the auditing with that. And that's and, and it's life-changing. It's, oh my God, my whole life has changed now. Well, give it a couple of days. You find out your life's not really that different. But, uh, but you remember that euphoria. You remember that wonderful feeling that you had. And that stays with you. And, and that is what you consider Scientology to be. And so you pay more money for it. And you're willing to be cajoled into other things. And maybe, and this is a common experience, uh, that next step that you take in Scientology isn't so amazing, isn't so wonderful. You don't have as big of a high from it, but you still remember that earlier high that you got, and you want that again, and they will tell you that you will get that again, and so you continue to try to, you know, uh, get the counseling, you continue to pay money for it, and then maybe something else happens, and you have another similar, you know, euphoric experience, and and that's sort of what keeps people going is that euphoric feeling, that that rush, that wonderful, you know, woof, wow, my life is so much better now. And uh, like I said, give it a give it a day or two, and you find out your life's not so much different than than it was. But uh, but that feeling, boy, that's it, it's it's kind of it's almost it's it's it can be related to. Uh, to drugs, you know, to how drugs feel, you know, you get that, whoo, and you want that again, and it's, it's kind of a similar, very analogous. J. Mazulowix 1. Hi, Chris. I'm wondering about the history of forced abortions and the Sea Org's no pregnancy slash children policy. This seems to contradict the twisted logic of the church. I would think that they would overwhelmingly welcome, in a ghoulish sort of way, members who were born into the church and were under the church's power from day one. Is there some purpose behind the policy as it stands now, 
or is this just another illogical fuck up by these idiots? Okay, so the this is the the policy now as it stands of of uh, no children in the sea organization is a direct result of earlier screw ups uh, with the sea organization with kids. It, when when the sea organization was first formed, children were allowed and there were children running around, but you know, clearly they were on a ship and that was not, you know, conducive to uh, production and it was very distracting and kids don't really contribute much and they cost a lot of money and take a lot of time to deal with. And so uh, when the Sea Org went to land, they established a cadet organization and they segregated the kids into, you know, their own little group off the, the away from the parents and the parents had family time. So one day a week, the parents could go and see their kid for you know an afternoon or a few hours or something and that was how it went through the 70s and the 80s and then what happened was this became burdensome but also those children were growing up and now schooling was needed and education and and you know they were troublesome because when kids get older man they they really you know they get into things and and then they start asking questions and then they're then they're not Scientologists, and you're trying to make them into Scientologists, and this whole thing, and, and pretty soon they have teenagers on their hands, and it was uh, a real problem. Uh, logistically, you know, economically, there was a lot of issues with this, and they came to find that this idea of, of you know, some person, and most of the people that they had dealing with and, and in charge of the kids were not very competent people. Uh, and they had their hands full. I mean, it, to give them the benefit of the doubt, they also had their hands full. They didn't have money. They didn't have, uh, you know, the ability to educate the kids well, that sort of thing. So basically, Scientology created a situation where they created a real mess. And those kids, some of them went out. They didn't want to be in the C organization. They didn't want to be Scientologists. And they went out and they hit the real world. And there was culture shock and there were problems and there were issues. And, uh, you know, some of these kids got into drugs and they got into partying and this kind of thing. And uh, the parents of those kids were still in the Sea Organization. And now their kid is out there, you know, binging on drugs or getting into trouble. And the parents are still legally responsible for them or still have attention on them or still want to be parents to them. And this just kind of creates this vicious, vicious situation. Um, because the whole... You got to understand, you know, the thing to know about all of this is that the Sea Organization as a group doesn't care about anything except what it's doing. It's, uh, you know, it's production. It's, it's, you know, Scientology 100% of the time. So kids and all that sort of thing got to be a real big distraction. So what they did was they decided that if you're in the Sea Organization, this was in the 80s, in the, in the, um, uh, late 80s, they decided that if you're in the Sea Organization and you have kids, what they're going to do is they're going to, you know, you get pregnant, they're going to ship you off and have you work at a local Scientology organization. You won't be in the Sea Organization, on the Sea Organization bases anymore. You'll be out in Denver or Vegas or, you know, Los Angeles or uh, Seattle or they're going to ship you out somewhere and you're going to uh, basically fend for yourself. You know, the couple goes out there and they're going to be staff at that church and that's all they're supposed to do but they're supposed to make enough money to raise their kid in the real world and deal with it that way. Well, by 1996 they found that was a total disaster because every one of those couples, almost one for one for one, I mean literally I can count on one hand how many of those sea organization couples succeeded. Most of them failed miserably, meaning they ended up leaving staff. They, they, they couldn't deal with it. They couldn't cope. They couldn't make money. They couldn't raise their kids and they, and they, they took off. They, they left uh, almost every one of them. And so by 1996, the Sea Org realized, okay, well that ain't working. And so they then went full draconian and said, okay, that's it. No more kids. Now the policy that was written and issued at the time said that if you get pregnant in the Sea Organization, you are going to be leaving the Sea Organization. And that was really all that was supposed to happen. But the Sea Organization doesn't have enough people in it, never has, uh, for the, all the work that they need to do. 
So what they did, uh, because they're not very nice people, is uh, they started pushing for abortions. And so, you know, 1996, 1997, 1998, uh, you know, people were getting yelled and screamed at if they got, you know, they got pregnant. And the Sea Organization guys didn't want to lose those people. So they said, well, the other option is you can get an abortion and then you don't have to leave. And the, the couples would go round and round on this, and uh, depending on their, you know, their, their own specific moral views or ideas. And, uh, and if they didn't want to do that, then they got yelled at and screamed at and that sort of thing and, uh, until they changed their mind. Or they didn't change their mind and they did end up leaving because the, the, if it got, you know, the mother got too big and it was just like, okay, going to have the kid. Then they'd get to the point where they didn't really have any choice anymore and abortion was no longer an option and out they went. But a lot of people uh, got abortions, a lot. And, um, and so then what happened is give it a few years and some of those people who had abortions left the Sea Org. They just, they just left, they got sick of it just like I did and they took off and they started telling their stories. Once the stories started hitting the media, about how badly kids were being treated, uh, had been treated in the Sea Organization, or how there had been, you know, enforced abortions, people getting yelled and screamed and pressured and this sort of thing. Once that started getting out in the real world, suddenly the idea of doing that within the church stopped because of all the bad press. And now it's to the point where if you're in the Sea Organization and you get pregnant, they don't even have a, they don't even talk about it. They, it's not even like, anything. It's just, oh, you're pregnant? Okay, good. Sign right here. Good, good, good. Do, do, do. And out you go. And, and you're kicked right out. Uh, and that's a direct result of the bad press that the church received uh, from their forced abortion uh, nonsense earlier. So that's the whole story of, uh, as I understand it, of kids in the Sea Organization and how it's evolved now to no kids. So there you go. And so we've come to the end of another episode of Critical q and I didn't get to as many questions as I wanted to this week, but I, I hope you enjoyed the answers I gave. I tried to be as, uh, as, as complete as I could on those. Um, if you have any questions for me at all about Scientology or anything else you want to ask me about, critical thinking, logic, reason, whatever, uh, just leave them in the comments section below, uh, or you can email them to me at the email address there in the, in the comments and in the notes section here. And, uh, and I, you know, thank you very much for watching and I'll see you next time.